Welcome back to Partial Derivatives in Thermodynamics in Physical Chemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about one of the most important partial derivative rules in any area of science. It could be physics, chemistry, biology in some cases, and so forth. And that is the multivariable calculus chain rule. All right, so suppose I have some function that looks like this, all right? So suppose it's a function that has three different variables. However, I can write each variable, x, y, or z, in terms of both of the others. Okay, so notice this x equals y, z. Okay, that's what I have here. Notice I could also divide both sides through by z and get it in terms of y, having y equals x over z, or x times z to the negative first. I could also take this and divide by y on both sides and get that z is equal to x over y or x times y to the minus first. Okay, so I can, in, I, can do, I can rearrange this in any way I want to solve for any of the variables, but they're all interrelated such that if I specify two of them, I know the other one. Okay, so in other words, x is a function of y and z, y is a function of x and z, and z is a function of x and y. Okay, I'll show you exactly why that's important after we discuss the rule itself. It turns out to be one of the most important rules. And it basically says that if I take the partial of x with respect to y at constant z times the partial of y with respect to z at constant x times the partial of z with respect to x at constant y, it equals something. And we want to figure out what that something is. All right, now one way to know, and it's very important that you're able to write this, because sometimes I can have variables like a, b and c, or I could have you know alpha, beta, and gamma. They could be anything. How do you know that you have all of these product of partial derivatives correct? Well, the way you notice is I, I notice I circled all the partial of x's in red. I circle all of the partials of y in orange, and all of the partials of z are in yellow. And in theory, what should happen is notice you have a partial of x over a partial of x, they should cancel. I have a partial of z over a partial of z, those should cancel. And a partial of y over a partial of y, those should cancel. And you might look at this, okay, and you might say, well, that should equal 1, all right? If everything cancels, it should equal 1. Well, I'm going to prove to you first, before we talk about why it's important, that this does not equal 1. It's close. But in fact, if you do this for any function of three variables that are interrelatable, it always equals negative one. And that might not seem intuitive, but let's go ahead and prove it. So I have three forms of this equation written here. x equals yz, y equals x over z, and z equals x over y. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to take these partial derivatives and then multiply them. So the first partial derivative I should take is partial of x with respect to y at constant z. All right. So all I'm going to do is take the partial of, of x with respect to y. That's just z. If y is what we're differentiating with respect to, z is a constant, so this derivative is just z. All right. Now if I take the partial of y with respect to z at constant x, okay, I have to do um, power rule because this is z to the minus first. So x is just a constant, so I'm going to multiply out by negative 1 and drop the power by 1. So this is going to be negative x, z to the negative second, or I'm going to write this as negative x over z squared. Then the final partial I want to take is the partial derivative of z with respect to x at constant y. So if y is a constant and I differentiate with respect to x, this is just single power, so it's just going to disappear, and then I'm going to get 1 over y. Okay. Now what the multivariable chain rule says is that if I want to, if I want to get something useful out of this, I need to take this, the partial of x with respect to y at constant z, times the partial of y with respect to z at constant x, that's this, and then times the partial of z with respect to x at constant y. So when I multiply all those, I should get negative 1. Now let's show that. If I take z times minus x over z squared times 1 over y, when I actually multiply it, notice one factor of z cancels with one here in the denominator, so I get negative x over y z. Now, that doesn't look like negative 1, but if I remember that x is equal to yz from the initial equation, I can take this yz, substitute it in for x, and I get negative yz divided by yz. And notice at that point that the yz's cancel, and you're just left with negative 1. All right? Now, that's, that's you know, pretty nifty. I had a pretty simple equation there. 
right? I just had x equals y, z, but what if I apply this to something that we hopefully already know at this point? Well, in this case, I'm gonna use something called the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT, all right? And notice that I can rewrite this equation much in the same way that I did this. I can rearrange it like x equals y, z, y equals x over z. I can do the same thing here, and I'll do that in just a minute to show that this, this product of partial derivatives equals minus one, all right? Now, um, in this equation, two things, two considerations when I do the ideal gas equation. I'm going to assume that both n, the number of moles, and the ideal gas constant are constants, meaning they're not parts of the, they're not uh, dependencies of each function. The only things I'm going to differentiate with respect to are going to be P, V, and T. All right? So much like um, we looked at in the previous example for the cyclic rule or the chain rule, partial of P with respect to T at constant V times the partial of t with respect to v at constant t times the partial of v with respect to p at constant t equals minus one. Again, how do I know that this is the correct way to write this? Well, I have a partial of p over a partial of p. Those should cancel. I have a partial of v over a partial of v. That should cancel. And a partial of t over a partial of t. That should cancel. Okay. And also notice one thing about this, these partial derivatives. If I have three variables here, whatever is not in this fraction p and t, which is v, that should be the subscript here. Notice t and v are, the, are the, in the derivative here, so p should be the subscript here. v and p are in this fraction here, so t should be out here, okay? And when I multiply those, it should equal negative one. Well, the first derivative I'm told to take is partial of p with respect to t. So what I need to do is write this in terms of p. So if I have p is equal to nRT, over v. I could also, if I wanted to, write this as nRT v to the minus first, but that's actually not going to matter in this case because I'm differentiating with respect to t. So in other words, the partial of p with respect to t at constant volume is just nR over v, right? Now let's do the next one. Now I'm told to take the partial of t with respect to v at constant p. So now what I need to do is actually rearrange this to solve for temperature. So temperature is gonna be equal to pressure times volume over NR. Over NR, that's the expression for temperature. So when I differentiate this with respect to volume, volume from this perspective is just to the first power in the numerator. So this is just going to be pressure over NR. And that's the partial of T with respect to V at constant P. The last one I want to take is the partial of V with respect to P. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this for volume. V is equal to nRT over P. And you may find it helpful in this particular case to write it as nRT P to the minus first. So when I do that derivative, partial of V with respect to P at constant temperature, it's with respect to P. P is to the minus first, so it's not a simple power rule problem. It's a more complicated one. I'm going to multiply by negative one out in front. NRT, P to the minus second, because I'm going to drop that power by one. And I can also write this as negative NRT over P squared. And then what the chain rule says, or the cyclic rule, is I should multiply these three partial derivatives. That would be NR over V. That would be P over NR. And then minus nRT over p squared. I should multiply those things and they should equal negative one. Let's prove that. Partial of p with respect to t, that's nR over v. So nR over v times, what's the next one? This is the partial of t with respect to v at constant p. That should be p over nR. And then I'm going to multiply the last one, partial of v with respect to p at constant t. It should be minus nRT over p squared. I'm going to put the p squared as p times p, and I want to prove that that's equal to negative 1. So I just need to simplify this. Now, several things um, to notice straight away is that this nR right there, it should cancel with that nR. Okay. Also notice that this pressure should cancel with one of the pressures there. Now, what else can I do to this? Well, I can notice that if I actually put it, if I actually um, combine all these terms, the nR and P appear to cancel, so it's just going to be nRT over VP is equal to minus one. 
All right, but if I remember from the ideal gas equation, very similar to what we did in the, in the initial example, if I remember that nRT over V, just that component, is the pressure, then I can rewrite this as negative pressure over, and that's going to be this pressure in the denominator, over P, and that's P over P. Pressure there cancels with pressure there, and then this is equal to minus 1. And so we've proven that. And basically, the deal with this cyclic rule, or this chain rule as it's often called, is that if I have any function like this, any function, let me circle this, any function that comes in this form, where x, which is, and they don't have to be x, y, and z, they could be all sorts of different variables. But as long as the first one is a function of the second and third, the second one is a function of the first and third, and the third is a function of the first and second, you can apply this cyclic or chain rule, and the product of all three partial derivatives has to be minus one. You could take any function, as complicated as you want. They could be so complicated you have to run it into a computer. But as long as you multiply them and take the correct partial derivatives, you always get minus one. Okay? And so why might this be useful? This identity where we, if we multiply the three partial derivatives, why could that be useful? Well, suppose I have a situation like this, okay, where I'm dealing with an ideal gas, okay, and I have this right here, right? This is just the, this is the uh, cyclic rule. Partial of P with respect to T at constant V times the partial of T with respect to V at constant P times the partial of V with respect to P at constant T is equal to minus 1, all right? Suppose, if I know this identity, suppose, for example, that I'm only interested in finding, oops, uh, let me not use that one. Um, suppose I'm only interested in finding, um, I'm tr I'm, suppose I'm trying to find the partial of V with respect to T at constant P. All right, I want this. What is it equal to? Now suppose also that that partial derivative, if I, you know, if say I had an unusual gas equation that was really complicated. Suppose taking this partial derivative was either impossible or suppose that it was so difficult and I was under time constraints, like on an exam, I didn't have time to actually take that derivative, or maybe I couldn't at all. So if you wanted this partial derivative, and you know this chain rule, then what you can do actually is you can multiply by the reciprocal of this second partial derivative. Why would I do that? Notice that the partial of t with respect to v at constant p is the reciprocal of the partial of v with respect to t at constant p. Well, the thing is, if I just look at normal fraction. Suppose I wanted 3 fourths x is equal to 1. Okay, I can treat this 3 fourths by multiplying by the reciprocal 4 thirds, right? So notice the, the 4 cancels with the 4 there, the 3 cancels with the 3 there. Well, I'm allowed to do that with derivatives too. It's not something they normally teach in, in most calculus courses, but differentials that are on the numerator and denominator, they actually cancel, okay? So you could sort of think of it like this. If I multiply times the reciprocal of this, which is the partial of v with respect to t at constant p, I have to do that on both sides of the equation. It's just like multiplying by anything. If you have an equation, you have to multiply the both sides by the same thing. So notice here, the, the differential of t cancels with this differential of t. The differential of volume cancels with this differential of volume. And then I have the partial of v with respect to t on the other side. That's going to leave only a few things. It's going to leave this partial of t with respect to v. It's going to leave this partial of v with respect to p at constant t. And it has to equal the negative 1 times this derivative. And so now, if I couldn't solve for the partial of v with respect to t at constant p, okay, then all I would have to do is actually calculate these two partial derivatives, partial of p with respect to t at constant v times the partial of v with respect to p at constant t, and I would multiply them, and that has to equal the negative of what I was originally trying to figure out. Now, you have a negative sign, but you can easily divide by the negative sign, and you can get maybe a more useful one slightly. Partial of v with respect to t at constant p is equal to negative partial of p with respect to t at constant v times the partial of v with respect to p at constant t. And perhaps this is actually a more useful form because I got rid of the negative sign on the derivative that I actually wanted to figure out. Okay, this should be a t right there. Okay, now this 
is it looks almost like a pretty complicated process. And in general, um, at first, when you first start practicing it, it can take a while. But why would this chain rule or cyclic rule be useful? Well, there are certain partial derivatives in thermodynamics that are extremely difficult to measure. There's also ones that are extremely difficult to calculate and sometimes both, okay? If you, if you run into a case where it's difficult to calculate or it's difficult to measure, you may want to express one partial derivative in terms of others that are easier to measure or calculate, okay? So for example, maybe it was difficult to measure the change in volume with respect to time at constant pressure. Well, if I can manipulate the cyclic rule expression to solve for maybe getting two others, as in these right there, maybe these are much easier to measure or calculate, I can just multiply them times negative one, and I get partial of v with respect to t at constant p. Okay. The other reason that it's useful is kind of along the same lines. Sometimes we may be able to uh, manipulate a partial derivative, and we may have to multiply by something else, but we can actually get it in to be a constant. And constants are things that you can look up in a table. Okay, A lot of times in thermodynamic data books, or sometimes you can Google them and you'll find them online. If you have some kind of partial derivative that is hard to measure, you can multiply them times other things and get it in terms of a constant. And you can just look up the constant in the back of a book or online and you can use that constant in place of the derivative. Okay, in a couple videos, we're actually going to look at calculation of, or actually derivation, I should say, of two um, constants that are in terms of some of these partial derivatives that I actually have here on this page. And those are beta and kappa. Okay, those are going to be extremely useful because there are some cases when your gas equation, unlike the ideal gas equation that is shown over here, Ideal gas equation is very easy to manipulate and use, but you can have very, very, very complicated gas equations that are empirical, they're not derivable. Okay, you have to empirically or experimentally determine them, and they're so complicated that taking some of these derivatives can be, they're not impossible, but very, very time consuming. So if you can just look up a constant, that's much better, okay? And it saves a lot of time. So in a future video, we're gonna look at the derivation of beta and kappa, and I hope this video helped. In the next video, we're going to explore some more, um, some more multivariable calculus that can help you in thermodynamics and all of PCHEM. See you in the next video.